Good morning and welcome to my session. My name is Ahmed Hashim and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, designing and implementation of cloud design patterns for Cisco NSO. I will begin with an introduction and uh, what's actually uh, the cloud design patterns. And uh, in this session, I'm going to cover three uh, patterns, the CQRS, throttling, and strangler, strangler fig. And at the end, the, I, will, I, will, I will do a conclusion. It becomes very important to continue scaling up NSO, use NSO in a complex use cases, and enable uh, NSO deployment on, on public cloud. The usage of service provider and enterprise customers for NSO is exponentially growing, and uh, the network itself grows, the use cases when it comes to 5G, connected cars, IoT, uh, digital health, all of these use cases requires uh, expanding the network and as a result, scaling up NSO and thinking about uh, different innovative use cases, which, which also require NSO itself to be uh, flexible and, uh, and dynamic. That's why the cloud design patterns are going to be very applicable to NSO deployments as well. So what's different when, when we compare cloud solution to a network automation solution? There, there are actually lots of differences, but I'm going to consider two differences uh, in this session. The first one is the scalability. When you go for a cloud solution, one of the primary reasons would be to be able to scale your solution, like auto scalability, and also to be able to do horizontal scalability for your system. The second, the second difference would be uh, distributed deployment. You can, you can have a cloud-based solution, which deployed in multiple regions across the world and serving your users from uh, a nearby data center, uh, basically, and use techniques like database sharding to make sure that data is um, uh, is segmented and uh, data is stored closer to where people are looking for it, and even using of read-only database replication uh, and cache storage in in your application. So these two things uh, are making cloud solution um, very much different from uh, standard uh, standard application. But what are the cloud design patterns and, and why do we need that? So the design pattern in general is a solution to a problem that uh, people face very often. And this solution could be reused. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. So and design patterns categories or cloud design pattern particularly categories are uh, data management, uh, design and implementation and, and messaging. Data management, like database sharding, as I uh, as I was was mentioned uh, earlier, or uh, CQRS, as I'm going to explain in this presentation, design and implementation is something like strang strangler fig pattern, which I'm going to explain in this session as well. Uh, messaging, that's that's very popular usage, like using of uh, asynchronous request and um, uh, publish subscribe pattern or priority queue in your in your um, messaging or in your application and how basically you can make your application loosely coupled uh, in order to scale uh, and, um, and and respond to the increase of the usage of your application so i will start with the first design pattern command and query responsibility segregation or short or for short it's a cqrs The purpose of this pattern is to separate read operations from update operation when it comes to your data storage. So if you have a database, by default, you do all the operations on your database. And CQRS implementation here is to have another copy from your database, a read-only copy that can be used only for read operation, and your main database could be used for the rest of the operation. The, benef the benefits here are you will maximize the performance and scalability of your solution. You can also secure your data to, to have read-only access uh, to a particular 
a particular load. Of course, you can do it in different other ways. Let's talk about read versus write or CQRS when it comes to a cloud solution. And here I'm going to take social media as a popular example. If, if the social media platform allow the user to post a content, this content could be a text or image or video or a mix. The content will be written once into the platform. Hundreds and thousands of users are going to read it. So technically, the database and the storage could be different. The specification of the storage could be different because you don't need the same um, performance when it comes to read versus write. So you can use You can use particular storage to write to, to for the for to write the content and faster faster storage to enable users to read or you can even have a, a cache in memory cache to be used to allow users to read the content. The social media platform uh, in order to achieve high availability and eventual consistency of the database, it makes copies of the same data in multiple regions. And this makes also the access to this content is much faster. One of the popular ways to enhance uh, performance and uh, to uh, enable the, the business intelligence in your application by having a read-only data replica from, your, from the whole database, that will be used only by analytics application to generate reports, dashboard, and insights. So this is how it will look when it comes to implementing CQRS in a standard, uh, uh, let's say, web application or cloud application, you need to have a, a main database that handle write, update, and delete, another database which is read-only, and synchronization is managed between both, which give you, gives you eventual consistency. And from the user interface or uh, your um, controller or the backend, depends on your the design of your application, you, you need to, to separate. Any query will go to a particular service that will read from the read-only database, and any command like update, delete, or create will, will go to the command service, which will use uh, the primary database. How this is related to Cisco NSO? That's the interesting question. So in this diagram, I'm showing a typical NSO uh, environment where we have uh, active node, and two standby nodes. So you can have actually multiple standbys uh, in, in your deployment to achieve JU redundancy. And this will be synchronized from the primary database. And if you want also, you can have synchronization between uh, standby one and the other standby nodes as well. And using of the virtual IP uh, as a load balancer to uh, basically used by the users. So northbound systems and users are using the VIP and the VIP points to uh, the primary uh, NSO instance. In case of failover, there will be uh, a, a switch. Stand, one of the standby nodes will become the master and take over the, the master role and start serving a northbound system. NSO can be scaled vertically by adding compute resources to the existing nodes, but it cannot scale horizontally by adding more nodes. The more nodes you add, it will achieve high availability, but it will not scale or in enhance the performance because there is always one active, uh, active NSO instance and the remaining nodes are standby. Even this is applicable to LSA architecture where you have CFS, RFS. Each RFS can scale vertically only. CFS can scale vertically only. You cannot scale horizontally. And in, in, a high, in a high available environment, the active node is, go is going to be used for all the operation, regardless of the workload or latency. So, which means standby nodes are rarely used, only used when, is, when there is a failure and one of the standby nodes will take over the active one. There are some use cases require very frequently or extensive read operations from NSO, NSO database. That 
could affect the performance and the throughput of the system. Some applications also um, can be doing uh, live status, so requiring or reading the reading data from your network via NSO or calling NSO actions to read data from uh, external systems if NSO is integrated with east-west um, uh, applications. So, depends on the usage of the system. I've seen in some environments, service provider environment, that percentage of the read operation is approximately 65%. So, 65% of the incoming requests to NSO are read only. So, how we can implement um, CQRS with NSO? That's the proposed solution to introduce an API gateway. And the API gateway will be um, the northbound system used by users and other applications. So all REST and REST conf AP requests will be received here and depends on the purpose of the API call. If it's read, then the API gateway will, will forward uh, the request to one of the standby nodes. If it's write, like update, delete, create, uh, then API gateway can forward it to the active, but to be on the safe side, will forward to the VIP, which in return, this is associated with uh, the active node. And of course, we have synchronization is going on between all the nodes. So the API get gateway here could, could be any, um, any open source or commercial API gateway. And um, in, in our demos, I'm using Kong API gateway with NSO. So the solution here will be to use uh, an API gateway. If the REST conf method is get, so the API gateway will forward the request to uh, to the standby node. If the if for any other request like put or patch or delete, then will forward it to the active node or to the VIP address. So I recommend to use the VIP to make sure we always reach to the active node. And on, on, in order for this solution to be aligned with the high availability framework used in NSO, um, uh, there, there is a script listening or subscribing to the HA notification. And whenever, uh, whenever there is a change in the HA configuration, like uh, there is a fail, the, stand, the active node failed and standby one is taking over. So that script can go to um, the Kong API gateway or our API gateway to modify uh, the configuration of active and, um, and standby nodes. So what are the use cases? If we are implementing CQRS with NSO, what is the benefits and what are the use cases that can be um, that can utilize that. The first and popular one, of course, if we have NSO as a service inventory, and we are talking here about hundreds of thousands of service instances in NSO CDB, and CDB exceeding 15 gig memory, for example. So um, usage of CQRS will offload the reading of the service configuration, service metadata uh, to, to be read from the standby node and will be offloaded from the active node. Similarly, if we are using NSO as a network inventory, like active network inventory or logical network inventory or physical network inventory, and there are some systems um, using NSO APIs to generate uh, reports or insights or doing forecast for the hardware. Um, so basically extensive reading from, from NSO because it's the active inventory. And uh, finally, uh, if we are using NSO as a self-service backend, Specifically in the B2C use cases, so assuming that you you are a service provider and you want to have a B2C self service and that your internet residential internet customer uh, will log into the self service portal and want to do bundles on demand parental control uh, to block some services or schedule um, some services to be uh, open or closed and uh, having some policies in your personal firewall to enable or, di or disable devices. So these kind of activities, it's very innovative. It increases customer satisfaction, but the disadvantage here is you're exposing NSO to be used as a backend for millions of internet customers. 
So that means NSO will receive tremendous amount of uh, uh, API calls. In many cases, to, to read information about the existing services and, uh, of course, to, to take actions uh, and change the configuration of, uh, of the service. So this, that's where you, you, you would be, um, it would be ideal to separate uh, read operation from command operation and the CQRS will enhance your performance significantly. So let, let's have a demo. Let's have a look at uh, the demo I'm preparing for this uh, design button with uh, Cisco NSO. Before the demo, let me explain uh, the environment. So my environment here is um, created using uh, a Docker and Docker Compose. So I have an NSO active, NSO 511, and I wanted to use it uh, to, to use REST APIs, not REST Conf APIs, and to, um, to, to actually uh, uh, make sure that whatever we do here can be used with very old versions of NSO, and it can be used in the context of NSO upgrade as well. So uh, I'm exposing two ports here, 8080 and 48, and, and the port 8001 would be uh, the port used for NSO active, and the IP address is 10.0.0.3. Uh, this is the standby NSO, uh, IP address is 10.0.0.4, and the ports 8.0.0.3 and 8.0.0.4. And then the Kong and Kong, Kong, and, um, uh, Kong has a database, it's a Postgres and uh, migration application, and the Kong itself. So the important port here is going to be port 6000 and 6001. So these are the ports that will be exposed to my, my, my local host. And um, we have an L, L3 VPN service deployed in NSO. For, for the sake of demo, I'm going to cover only the QS. I'm not going to talk about topology or L3 VPN service itself, just, just uh, as, a, as a proof of concept for, uh, for the design pattern. So here I have a QS policy that has a name. So that's about the environment and the service itself. And uh, I'm using Postman here to, to do all the necessary configuration in, in Kong API Gateway. I have two folders in my, in my Cloud Design Patterns project. The first one is for NSO. This is a direct NSO uh, 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 APIs. So here I'm using uh, localhost and port 8001, that would be for the active node. And um, all of this, this is the, the QS. So this is to get list of QS uh, from NSO directly. If we run it, this is the QS policies we have, bronze, demo 525, gold, and, uh, and silver. Similarly, I have for topology and L3 VPN, but this is not my concern right now. I hope we don't need this again, let me close it to avoid confusion. But now let's have a look at the Kong APIs itself. So I'm using Postman to do the Kong configuration and also to use um, the Kong um, service itself. So in order to have an Kong API gateway on top of NSO to, to implement the CQRS, I need to have uh, two services. The first service for read only, so I call it NSO QS read, and I'm using here the standby node port 8080. So this is the QS URL, and this is the standby node. And similarly, for write, I'm using the active one, 10.0.0.3, the same URL. So I create like two services to in, in Kong, one for read and one for write, and I'm going to use to, to, to create a, a root for each one, but having the same path, slash QS. So basically here I'm saying, in NSO QS read service, create a root, which is slash QS, and use it only if the method is get. Similarly, here, I have NSO QS write, this is the service, so I'm creating a new root in the existing service, and the path for this route is QS, the same one I used here, but the methods are only delete and post. So if I do post or delete, we'll go to this service. If I do get, I will go to that service, NSO QS read. 
So these are the necessary configuration to do um, to, to to basically have a, a proxy for uh, in Kong API for our NSO uh, QS service. So if I want to do get on QS, this is the the path we configured earlier, and the method here method here is get. I will run it. Okay, so I have an API rate limit exceeded because, because I pass the hourly limit. So let's try again after fixing this uh, problem. When we send the request to, if you remember, uh, the Kong API gateway on port 6000 and the path is QS and method is get. So this will go to the standby uh, NSO node and I'm getting the same, the same results we have seen before. Let's have a look at the create QS. And here I'm using, uh, I'm creating a, a policy called demo and attach to it random number generated by this uh, pre-request uh, script. And uh, still I'm using Kong API proxy, the service and the path is QS. So the Kong API gateway uh, will, will understand that if this is a post and the, the, the path is QS, it will forward to the active NSO, uh, NSO node or the VIP depends on your configuration. So this has been created, status is 201, and let's have a look at the headers, response headers. So you see the location here is 10.003.80.80. So this is the URL for, for the service on the active, uh, the active node. Uh, delete will work the same way. So if I want to delete 328, I will use delete. And the policy name here is going to be demo. Three to eight. Um, again, I'm still using Kong. I will do send. So content has been deleted. Uh, I can do the same for five, for uh, five to five. Content has been deleted. If I try again, the proxy get QS uh, API. I expect only to see bronze, gold, and silver. Yeah, that's it. So this is how basically um, we configured the Kong API gateway to have two services, one for read and one for the rest, and to have the same path for my QS and how we tested using uh, um, uh, the APIs for Kong uh, to, to create, retrieve, and delete uh, QS policy. Let's go back to the next next pattern. So the next pattern is the throttling pattern, and uh, throttling pattern is basically used to control the consumption of the resources, how we consume the resources on our uh, APIs, uh, and this consumption could be by users or by an application or by a tenant of your application. Um, so basically, this control allows you to, to make sure that system is continue to function and meeting the SLA and you're not compromising performance uh, in case of any, any abuse or misuse of the uh, APIs. A popular example here when for the throttling des design pattern is stock market API. So let's assume company A is offering an API as a service to, to allow users to fetch stock market um, prices and data. This service is usually not real time. Real time requires to have um, publish, subscribe, and some, um, some other techniques, but the, the standard APIs are usually, um, it has a delay, could be a few seconds, could be a minute, and has certain limitation, but often, Consumers of the APIs would try to uh, would try to 
increase the number of requests to get more frequent uh, updates, but that could affect the backend service. So the owner of application A for the stock market API will need to introduce rate limit to have to say like every consumer can send up to five requests per second to retrieve prices for a particular uh, symbol or let's say one request every 10 seconds um, for a particular symbol. And if you want to read historical data, which is another API, you can do it only one time every hour because the response is gonna be huge. You get the history of a particular symbol for a year. So you, I don't want you to request that every minute. So you, you get it once every hour. So this kind of limitation will help um, company A to utilize the resources and to make sure that they can support large number of consumers without, without having any performance issue. So basically, if, you, if the usage of a, a particular user is in A, this is normal, uh, sorry, in, in one, this is normal usage, two, this is active user, which is okay, three, this is not allowed because you exceeded the rate limit. I want to stop you from doing that. Let's see how it can, it can work in our uh, in our deployment. How this can be aligned with Cisco NSO. Um, NSO can be used in a multi-tenant environment. It's not a popular architecture, but I've I've done it before. Um, so you can have one of the examples is in in a service provider environment. You have multiple network domains. You have access. You have wireless, you have security, uh, you have um, uh, transport, and so on. So you have multiple domains, and for each domain, there is a team responsible for that. And in order to make sure that no mistake could happen and no devices would be used without proper um, permissions, NSO role-based access control using NACM will be used. And that's how we can have a multi-tenant environment in NSO. So tenants here could be departments, could be uh, an opco, like uh, if you are a service provider in multi-country, in multiple countries, you can, for each country, you can have a, a tenant, okay? So tenant here could be also a northbound, uh, northbound API user, if you, are, if you have, um, if you have network as a service, you ex expose API to wholesale uh, enterprise or uh, your enterprise customers to do certain network activities using API. So tenant here could be could be multiple uh, multiple things. Similar to the CQRS, we are going to use the API gateway to control the or to configure throttling for our APIs. That could be on consumer level, so for each consumer, this is your limit. You can do fine grain rate limit as well. So for every consumer, uh, this particular URL, you can do uh, X number per, per seconds and Y numbers per hours. So you can have multiple policies for rate limits. So the use cases here, as I, as I mentioned, that could be used for network as a service B2B users. You can have, uh, you can sustain NSO environment in a multi tenant uh, deployment. And you can limit, if you have a B2C use cases, uh, as I explained in the CQRS design pattern, you want your residential internet consumers to enjoy these services, but you want to make sure they don't exceed um, the regular usage. For example, change your bandwidth on demand once every day okay otherwise you're going to make the the billing system um really um, um your bill will, will look really funny like switching between different speeds on the same day so even it has a business justification here so once a day you can call the bandwidth on demand uh, api and parental control if you want to uh, schedule service up or down you can do it like two times a day and so on. So basically control how people are using your APIs. And finally, you, you could have in existing NSO deployment, 
um, most of the mo most of the service providers are using tools for bulk service activation and deactivation, and this requires running uh, the the uh, lots of lots of um, activation and creation of service and changing of service every day depends on you know the data you get from from billing system, and very often it requires executing that in off peak time to avoid affecting the service, but it can affect the service as well for any uh, use cases like closed loop assurance. And uh, some service providers are running this script every six hours because they have millions and millions of, of, uh, of customers. So in order to make sure that bulk service activation doesn't really affect the performance of NSO, until we scale up NSO or until we change the design, let's introduce throttling. So even if the tool is not um, is, is is not currently uh, implementing any uh, any uh, throttling or delays, we do it in NSO and step by step uh, change it in, this, in the bulk activation as well until we change the design or scale up the environment. So let's have a demo on this on this pattern. Again, I'm still using um, I'm still using Kong API Gateway here. And the configuration is interesting. So you need to, to configure the northbound consumer. So here I have one consumer called uh, MBI, okay, northbound interface. And I, I did some configuration here, like um, maximum number of requests per seconds will be five and per hour will be 200, okay? That will be for the customer, no matter what API is calling, for all the APIs, the total, Per hour will be 200. Okay, that, that would be one step. We can also dig deeper into um, fine grain services like read. The service we created before NSO QS read will, will, will create the rate limiting plugin, and that will be the configuration. The number of requests per second maximum is five, and per hour 30. Okay, and for the right, this is the other service in its NSO QS, right? Number of maximum number of requests per second would be five and per hour 50. So you have the control, honestly. Okay, let's try. Uh, let's see first if I'm northbound system and uh, NSO introduced rate limiting. How can I uh, uh, align my application? How can I design my application to respect this rate limit? Can I just configure it similar to uh, similar to the configuration here, or there is a more programmatic way to do that? Let's have a look. So I will run the same API one more time. I get I got the same result. That's good. Let's have a look at the headers. So the response headers, if you see here, so I have rate limit remaining and rate limit. So rate limit is five. That's per second and rate limit per hour is 30 okay and remaining late rate limit per hour is 10 so i have 10 more requests left after that i will get uh, an error and i have four requests per second of course we cannot test the per second unless we do some kind of load test but we can we can definitely have another look so get decremented to nine, eight, seven, six, five. So if I'm a northbound application, I would pay attention to this value. And as I approach zero, I would introduce a delay in, in my application. So that's how programmatically northbound system can also re respond to having great limit in NSO. Let's have a look if we, if we keep limiting if we keep calling the API, I will finally get 429 too many requests. So now I'm not allowed anymore to call the QS API, the read, the, the read QS API, I can do right. So if I, if I will do right again, yeah, this looks good. I have here, um, I still have 11 more left per hour, the current hour. I can keep creating until I get there. 
and the total should not exceed 200 because for for this for the northbound api user i have the maximum per hour is 200 and you can have really uh, complex policies when it comes to rate limiting um, yeah based on the service based on the consumer uh, you, you name it all right that's how we implemented the throttling with nso uh, let's go to our third and last design pattern strangler fig pattern this pattern is interesting one it's used if you have a legacy system and you want to do an incremental migration to replace piece by piece of uh, of the system without of course um, without of course affecting uh, the, the 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 usage of the system until you do complete migration and then you can switch over and decommission the legacy system completely and the name the name of the pattern came from uh, uh, one of the fig trees which basically um, uh, the tree after aging uh, will be uh, will be replaced like some uh, some of the roots will be will, will grow up on the tree itself and the, the 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 new tree will grow and will swallow the old tree okay so how does it work like to to do strangler fig pattern for legacy migration you need you will have your legacy system and you need to build a new stack for the modern system and a new layer here on top of both called strang strangler facade. So that will be the layer used by the users and will be responsible for uh, dispatching the request to either legacy or modern. And from, uh, from the back end, you need to start migrating your, your data and services from legacy to the modern piece by piece, feature by feature, until you, you complete the migration. Only then you can decommission the legacy system and there is no need here for the strangler facade pattern. So your system has been migrated successfully. So how this is related to NSO? In the past, in the past uh, two years, NSO upgrade from NSO4 to NSO5 was one of the hot topics. And this is a scenario I've seen with, um, with some uh, customers using NSO for five, seven years, and um, the customers didn't really upgrade it on time, which makes things more complicated. And because some use cases cannot tolerate a uh, long maintenance window or downtime, so it becomes ideal to build a new instance here on new stack of NSO and deploy the new versions. Let's say NSO 4X, we have L2 VPN and QS, uh, and uh, we build a new stack using latest version of NSO5 and deploy the new version of L2 VPN uh, QS and even introduce a new service like ACL. Okay, so this new system uh, is there, but it's not used. Everybody is using NSO4 and we want to migrate and decommission that one. We have to develop this layer, which is a strangler facade. That could be a standalone application you can make use of um, API gateway as well, or, or uh, develop uh, sort of APIs uh, to, to, to be used by northbound system. And the implementation of the APIs will be basically the logic here, which is for any incoming uh, create service API, don't go to here because we want to get rid of it. We don't want to create services here. We want to create services there in NSO5. So ACL definitely, because it doesn't exist here. And for QS and L2VPN, there might be new service parameters needs to be added to the model. So basically create the service here and send the feedback to the caller. But if you get read, update, delete for the existing services, you still need to go to the old NSO version. And from our back end, we have a migrations application, reading the service instances from here and creating the new services there. Okay, this is not a standard uh, NSO upgrade, right? It's uh, building a new stack from a legacy one. Okay, so this is incremental migration. And whenever, whenever uh, the migration application creates a service here, one of the ideas to enhance the performance of the solution is to, to create a cache 
something like uh, Redis or any in-memory cache to say that service ID 1234 has been moved to NSO5. So whenever the Strangler facade receive a new request to read the service, it will first look it up here. If it exists, we'll check which node. So basically we'll, we'll have a direct access to the node to read the service information. If it doesn't exist, so most probably it's not migrated yet. So we'll read the data from here. So that will be more, more efficient and will not have any performance impact. The migration will keep going and updating the cache until no service instance is here. So we can decommission uh, NSO4 completely. And uh, next step, of course, will be to get rid of the strangle facade and the cache. And we will have our NSO, uh, NSO5 environment with all the service instances from here and all the inventory data and the new service models as well. So it's really interesting and complicated, but it, it, it will be used in such complex, uh, complex scenario. So the usage of Strangler Fig pattern mainly is to migrate from old NSO to a new NSO without service disruption, or let's say minimal service, service disruption. Um, that would be ideal for customers using uh, NSO in, let's say, mission critical applications or um, uh, or closed loop automation or automated assurance. So you cannot have a long maintenance window where NSO is down because NSO is in, in the heart of your network and consuming uh, real time network monitoring data and take action accordingly. In that case, you want really to minimize the, the downtime whenever you do any maintenance for NSO. So this is how a strangler effect pattern can, can be used. You can use it also if you have as a minimal implementation just to uh, migrate old service to new service, even within the same NSO environment. That's it for the strangler fic. Um, it's not uh, it's not easy to demonstrate. So um, um, basically, my 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 key takeaway here is most of the cloud design patterns can can be used to solve complex use cases for service provider and enterprise. Uh, customers with Cisco NSO, you might think in the beginning that it's not applicable. It looks perfect in a cloud environment, but with some tools like API gateway or uh, messaging queue or other uh, enabling technology, you can achieve the use case without even uh, doing much changes in your architecture, and you will be able to achieve the, achieve these complex uh, complex use cases, which De demanded by most of most of NSO developers and engineers in in the in the innovation domains of uh, IoT, connected cars, digital health, 5G, and 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 so on. So, finally, as I said in the beginning, it's very important to continue scaling up, enhancing performance, uh, and use NSO in complex use case as it is capable of, and enable deploying NSO in public cloud. So these patterns will help you to, even if you move to public cloud completely, uh, to achieve the same expectation from a cloud solution. Thanks a lot for your time. I hope the session content was useful to you and looking forward to see you in the rest of the presentations.